You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Laments, The Extrovert. And I'm Joe Anthony, the writer, researcher, and introvert, whose job it is to dig through the outer layer of no-duh on the internet. We are back, busting myths, um, our top ten myths, that we things that Joe and I would have sworn by, would have died for, and now we're realizing a lot of them aren't even true. <laughs> I feel dumber after the last episode finding out how many things I believe that aren't true. Um but as far as myths go, because of our episodes, the way they're usually structured is we bust three big myths about one topic and, you know, it, it blows our mind and we, we figure out how to reanalyze life. It, it changes really the way we think and are self-aware. For these episodes, we're at the bottom of the crumb bag of myths. We're, you know, when you tilt up the Doritos bag and you just eat all of the little pieces that are still there and you get a mouthful of just nothing but Cheeto dust and delicious crumbs. That's this episode as far as myths are going. These are the delicious crumbs of myths that we are just upending into our mouths and um, being gluttonous about. Um, let, me, let me kick <laughs> us off with our top, my top five. And, oh, please. And I'm still dabbling and reading through the religious ones. We're all fascinating. There are so many of these. I challenge everyone to go through this and, and read through all of them. And you're going to find another 10 that you like more than the ones that, that we put up. These are going to be your, your next... <laughs> 10 dinner conversations i swear like you're going to be at work re repeating oh yes yeah. <laughs> this makes you more interesting i promise <laughs> this gives that when you're having that dinner party conversation you're going to hear oh really so which, which is what you go for right eye contact and not, them not trying to spin off and roll away from you. right we're we're making ourselves look dumb on a podcast so you can look smart at work which is great okay my number five this is in the religion of uh, buddhism now I'm going to ask you, Joe, what does Buddha look like appearance-wise? Uh, he looks like that fat golden statue at the Chinese restaurant. Like he, he's got a robe and he's got a big bald head and you rub his stomach for luck. Yeah, big tummy and everything, little chunky monkey. Yeah, exactly. The historical Buddha is not known to have been fat. That little chubby monk... The fat Buddha, that's Western, uh, <laughs> the West developed that in the 10th century. What? And it's about a Chinese folk hero by the name of Buddha. So that is not, when you see that little Buddha, that's not. Uh, the real Buddha's buff in shape, thin. <laughs> I recall very vaguely from reading Joseph Campbell that like, he he fought people like he was a he was a fighter and stuff but like i didn't have a visual concept of that i was imagining i uh, literally the little fat golden statue fighting monsters and like you know um adversaries santa claus yeah. santa claus yeah exactly jo jovial and sweet yeah. we fortune cookied a goddamn folk hero like that that is <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> Ugh. Well, I'm sure he doesn't appreciate being made fat. Like Bruce Lee, remember we did an episode about what would a, what would a, a balding, uh, pudgy Bruce Lee look like? We know what that looks like you now. Know. <laughs> it's, it's, we see him every time we go to a Chinese <laughs> restaurant. Okay, well, I'm mine. You started off with a mind blower that that touches on both religion and Chinese food. So you you started started pretty strong there. I'm I'm just gonna go with some basics in cooking. Um, I thought that when you are cooking a steak or a, a pork chop or something, that when you turn up the heat to sear it, you're sealing in the moisture. I I thought like like my my grandmother taught me that, so I thought it was like gospel. And apparently, it actually takes moisture out. I mean, that makes sense. It's it's a burning plate or or you know pan. So I feel dumber for not knowing this, but it doesn't sear in anything. It actually takes some moisture out, and it browns it and improves the flavor and texture. Um, I think Grandma's just a liar. What else did she tell you? <laughs> she <laughs> she tell you you get pregnant by shaking hands with girls or anything like that? <laughs> she told me the world was round, and I know that's a lie now. No, I'm the kidding. Old <laughs> <laughs> the old witch? It's the old witch. Legit, one of the ones that I've held on to and I hate it is she told me that you have to clear your plate and that that builds healthy habits and you're, you know, you're being disobedient if you don't clear your plate. And now I know that's just called overeating. 
So yeah, I I know that <laughs> wisdom uh, from the older ages is not always wisdom. Sometimes it's just like this is the best they knew in their era, and they didn't have a wiki list of misconceptions to to check. So this is why they I'm thought it. Say, these country these country witch doctors don't don't always live overseas. We got a lot of those here, right? In America. <laughs> okay, so that was that was my number well, five. My ne- what's your what's yours? My number four is. There is absolutely no evidence that violent video games cause people to be more violent. There's no link. Um, and popularity of gaming has con- has um, coincided with a decrease in youth violence. So it's actually the opposite. That can't be possible because we have seen so many shootings lately. Like I, I not the. I know we we debunked that back in the Columbine shooting that the the was it the judges or prosecutors absolutely insisted that violent video games is why they went on their rampage, but at least it's got to contribute to some of that violence, right? Or is it just the statistical Wait, average? There's is no down? link. There's just more violence in the world. Okay, but it's not from that. And they and they also said that w- where this awareness came, why we got this in our mind in the eighties, during the nineteen eighties and in the two thousands, there was so much legislation passed, so much press on that that it contributed to violence. That we believed, let's pass these things, make games less violent, put stickers on on rap things with swearing, and I'm talking about sex. But that stuff doesn't change the things that happen. It, it has no effect on it. So it was just another moral panic. Exactly, and it's just we we, we were educated by these by these senators, Congress people who were saying, "Oh, we got to do, we got to pass these laws." So we, we hear that, we think there's a problem, right? Why would you pass a law if there isn't if it isn't causing problems and stuff? That at least makes me feel better about letting my very young cousin play Grand Theft Auto back in the day, watching a uh, watching a very young girl beat people up with a golf club in a game. Um, that was slightly disturbing, but I feel I, I don't feel like I have caused violence now, so that's fine. Uh, <laughs> I've got a I've got a fun number four for anybody who is like watched the movie Amadeus. Do, have you seen the movie Amadeus? Out of curiosity, in the eighties. Yep, <laughs> that was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. Yeah. It was eighty four. That's when I was born. Before your time, yeah, I was breakdancing back then, 1984. Yeah, oh, literally the year I was born. Um, Antonio Solari, uh, Antonio Solieri was the um, narrator and villain of that, and supposedly he poisoned Mozart. That that was frequently is cited as the cause of Mozart death. Uh, Mozart's death is that he was oh, poisoned. Oh, I read that one. I read that. That is a good one. Oh, man. Yeah. That was one of my make-it lists. Okay. Yeah, that almost made your list. I, I went with it because I. Yeah. it made me curious enough to go find out why Mozart died, which is actually more interesting. So, like, I... Well, so the, the misconception was that he died. He was poisoned, right? That's what everyone thinks. Right. Every Everyone thinks it was a conspiracy, and he Mozart was poisoned by his rival, That this guy that wished he could play like Mozart and, you know, was a failure in life because he did Jealousy, right? Jealousy, yeah. Poison Mozart out of jealousy. I went looking for the real answer that wasn't listed on our, our misconceptions list. Mozart basically died of strep throat complications. Like, like he had, um, turns out he had um, just, bad tonsils. He, he had tonsillitis for a very long pr- time. Yeah, which was, pro- which was probably pretty common in pre, pre-antibiotic uh, time, right? I mean. Right. And so he it caused an infection, yeah, um, and it it led to him having like coughing fits and a cerebral hemorrhage and like, um, yeah, it 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 was a mess. It, he basically died of way infection. less, way less sexy than being murdered by one of your uh, romantic rivals or artistic rival, right? <laughs> That's exactly why I think the myth has been so pervasive. Is it's not just because a movie said it. I think it's because. That is the ending we want for him. We we want Mozart to have died something you know dramatic and sexy and interesting, like being poisoned by a rival, just having strep throat yeah. and passing. That that is sad. <laughs> but I I leave it to me for my my fourth myth to to bring us to a sad place. So I hope your next one is uplifting. Well, I'm going to give you another one, another visual here. How would you describe the the size and stature of? Uh, we did a sh- an episode about him, um, 
shameless self-promoting. Was it shameless self-promoting? Napoleon Bonaparte. Okay. The Conqueror. Um, How would you describe him? What was our show we did about him? What was that about, Joe? Uh, propaganda. We, we found out that Napoleon yeah. was... I, that episode is still one of my all-time favorites just because we got so deep into... He was a master of propaganda. He caused more deaths than almost any other leader. Like he, he took over and dismantled newspapers. Like he, he was the master of like political propaganda, and it was. He was a manipulator. Yeah, a master manipulator. I think is what we kind of touched on in that episode. I was thinking promotion. He did promote himself better than most leaders of any countries, but he also was very manipulative. It had a way of spinning his misfortune yeah that was the name of the episode i I believe it was manipulation but yeah it was and he was he was uh, tiny like like he's the size of a chess piece (laughs) his height so how tall let's just say how much did he weigh and how tall was he i'm gonna go if i'm guessing i'm gonna go five two and like uh i'll say 140 pounds he looks kind of chubby in his pictures you are very very good but but Five foot two inches was in French feet, which in English measurements is about five point five foot seven, which for the 1800s, Joe, was not a short person. It's not really even a short person nowadays, but at that time, that would have been average height or a little bit above. Okay. So he wasn't a shrimp. He wasn't a little guy. We, oh, you got the Napoleon complex. Oh, you're a little guy. He's got the little guy Napoleon complex, right? That's... How many times have you heard heard or said that? I've literally used the phrase Napoleon complex to describe people who are like short and trying to be. Oh, I okay. So just for fun, I looked it up while we were talking. Five feet nine is the current American average for height. So Napoleon was even like very close to average for an American now, which. You're right. I, so yeah, for back then he would have been he would have been a taller guy. Yeah. <laughs> people were a lot smaller. Yeah. Well, this is why they say it happened, Joe. I thought this was very interesting. He always was surrounded by his goons, his thugs, the Imperial Guard. And they were all selected based on how big and tall they were. So it wasn't that he was short. He just had these NBA basketball dudes around him. He had the tallest people in the world as his personal bodyguards, of course. Who wouldn't who wouldn't want to have the big ones, right? <laughs> so that gave the perception that comparably he was short. Okay. I I guess that means that if you are going to be a world leader and a master of propaganda, the one thing that he had a blind spot for was he surrounded himself by the elitist, toughest guys possible. That's why when I become a dictator, I'm going to pick um, all of my guys will be elite fighters from countries that have short people. So like all of my goons are going to be masters of jujitsu and they're going to be five, two and like no higher. <laughs> These mean little like wildebeest kind of right. Tasmanian devil guys, <laughs> <laughs> like like Gurkhas. Um, okay, well, actually, since we're talking about uh, <laughs> hired goons and and the height of uh, fighters, we we did an episode once about martial arts and fighting in general. Like we we went into the the science of how a hand is built to form a fist and punch other people. And like we we talked about our experience in different martial arts and boxing and things, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pick one off of this list that I already knew, but I think is just so pervasive I wanted to bust it anyway. The black belt in martial arts does not mean somebody's a master. Um, a black belt in martial arts means basically nothing. It it was originally in judo in the 1800s, late 1800s, and it just meant. You were, really? Because cause back in the 80s, Joe, you'd say that. If there's a guy, you'd say, he's a black belt. You can't mess with him. He'll kick your ass, you know? Right. <laughs> I mean, it was like... <laughs> yeah, like the karate kid like is looking for his black belt. Like, yeah, black belts... Um, it, yeah, it, my my uncle would beat you up because I would claim he had a black belt in some, you know, foreign martial art that sounded impressive. But um, no, a, a black belt just means you have basic competency in all the different techniques of the sport. So like it doesn't mean So it's the opposite. It's Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's the 101. It's like you just got started. You can you can kind of you know how to stand, you know how to kick, you know how to punch a little, but you're just you're just learning. You're you're in the infancy of your martial arts career at this point. Right. It's it's 
you have learned your ABCs and your basic addition and subtraction. Like it, it's it's like entering the first grade. You've learned all the basics of everything, and now you can actually begin your career. Um, and I was I was taught another myth uh, when I was in martial arts that the original black belts um, from like Korea. They're, they had a black belt because they had just worn it for so long that like <laughs> the belts were just gross and grimy and they had gotten black by just wear and tear. I don't think that's true either. I'm guessing that nobody is sporting like a gross off-white brown belt and just being like, well, that means I'm a master. So, um, yeah. It's like toilet paper belt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> we are a couple of grimy kind of you know not change our clothes every day kind of guy so you know i get that one right <laughs> i just want to share that that's i, I yeah I, I thought that was fun and interesting my number two we're getting down there we're getting down and getting down, dirty here okay yep and this one is a body one a sex one um penis size it's not it doesn't correlate with race hand size or foot size that is a myth but, and a big but on this is how long your fingers are might. Okay. So if you're looking for a partner with a large penis, you want to focus not on their hands, their size, their tall, their height, but on how long their fingers are. <laughs> oh, okay. I need to wear extra long gloves then is what I'm hearing. Okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> if, if this was common knowledge that would be helpful but it's just going to look like I lost fingers in the war and <laughs> wearing floppy <laughs> gloves <laughs> okay well I've got a, a number two here and it's about um, it, it's something that has rippled out and I knew of the story because I worked in like different fields of security um, there is the classic Kitty Genovese murder that happened in the 1960s and that happened in it was a Brooklyn or New York or something. And supposedly it was the, um, the, the ground is it like the bystander effect or something like it laid the groundwork for a theory in psychology where, um, bystanders will do nothing unless they are put in a position of responsibility. And that part is mostly true. But the false part is that the history of it got skewed, that, you know, public outrage was that 37 neighbors, uh, to, to tell the story in very brief, a woman named Kitty um, had an angry, jealous um, boyfriend who came back with a knife and stabbed her, and it was brutal, and she, like, got away, and then he came back and stabbed her some more, and then, like, she crawled into a, a, an apartment uh, alcove, and, and he came back and murdered her, and it, it was this long taxing fight uh, that like they screamed and they, they made a lot of noise and these neighbors should have done something. And the, the quote they used over and over again uh, was that 37 neighbors just watched from their windows and did nothing at all. And they didn't even call the cops. Um, and that was right. such a fiery story. Like it was a glad, what's that? Like it was a gladiator thing, right? Right. Exactly. Like it was a gladiator thing. Just a lot of people who couldn't leave Jeopardy and they, they would not. Yeah. <laughs> but OK, so that spawned um, different policing. It, it spawned different policy from state to state about like bystanders and like getting people to to help. It, it spawned a movement for independent security. There, there's the Guardian Angels, which are like a, um, a volunteer security group. They wear red, wear red berets. You can see them around Portland sometimes. Apparently, all this has spawned off of not reality. Like, it's it's false. Um, there were not 37 neighbors. Um, in fact, witnesses only heard a brief portion of the attack and didn't know what was going on. Only six or seven actually saw anything whatsoever, and they didn't see the full picture. They didn't see necessarily the, the stabbing taking place. Only one witness told the police. He, he called the police, so even that part is false. But the one who called the police said, I didn't want to get involved which is later something they attributed to all the neighbors. So humans are not that horrible right. of people. We do not want to see people get stabbed. We will not just turn our back to go back to watching daytime TV. You know, it, it's, <laughs> there is the bystander effect. You know, you do actually have to, if you have an emergency, you've got to point to somebody and say, hey, you call 911, please. 
So you do have to pick people out and, and give them responsibility. But once you do, they'll do something like it's it's not as bad as we thought. So that is such a big myth. I wanted to, to sneak that into the, the lower end of the countdown. But we're really overdosing me on myths. I'm, again, I'm only conditioned for about two or three myths <laughs> a, a show. So this is a lot for me. But I do, you know, to kind of talking here about uh, Joe's done a, he wrote an article that got, uh, went viral about um, gladiators. And you told me one time that the gladiators is not like what we think on about in Hollywood, the, what the times, what the gladiator fights were really like. Can you kind of go down that myth for, for me? Sure. Briefly. Um, yeah, it, it was it. The the article that went viral years ago was uh, Emperor Commodus was a complete insane person um, and that the movie gladiator totally had him wrong. They were like, yeah, he wanted power and he was, you know. Uh, he was such a um, uh, a tyrant. And in reality, he was really well beloved. It's just that he was way too into sports. And that's r- like he, he became a gladiator and made people come watch him be a gladiator, even though he sucked at it. The reality was being a gladiator was much more like football, like like these guys did not want to kill each other. Uh, like they they were good at their jobs. They were good at being soldiers and they're good at fighting. But um, their goal was to draw blood without killing each other because it was good for the crowd. Like, the crowd loved it. They w- were oftentimes out of shape. Like, they would be, if you're a big fat guy, <laughs> it's easier to draw blood without hurting somebody than if you're, like, very thin and easy to hit, like, a vital organ. So these these guys were just these big, hulking dudes, like, almost like sumo wrestlers, who would slash at each other and make a good show of it, basically like professional wrestlers. And then go back to the brothel and have a beer and hang out yeah, like, together. They, not dead. No, not not fight to the death. Not the. It was like no. It, <laughs> and didn't it go on for like long time? Like they be people just sitting around and stuff. It wasn't like this this uh, well choreographed uh, Vegas show. <laughs> no, not at all. It went it went on. It was lengthy. Um, they would they had sponsorships. Like you can look up pictures that they have taken of like. <laughs> Walls. like nascar exactly like like there's one where like it's like drink my olive oil it's the best and it's like a picture of a gladiator <laughs> holding up an olive oil uh visit the mall and takes a keepsake home to your loved ones <laughs> on the way out don't forget to tip your server yeah they would sell gladiator sweat <laughs> like like they would sweat into like a, a sponge or a bottle and they'd sell it to like ladies who came to watch the, sh- the games they, they it was it was wrestling really it was nascar it, oh absolutely yeah <laughs> And nobody died. Oh, people people great. died from that's time to time, one. but like usually it was animals. Like they killed a lot of. Um, they would bring in wild bears and stuff, and they would. It would be fun to watch the gladiators, you know, javelin a, a tiger or something. Well, my number one. Are you ready, Joe? I'm ready. This is one that I would have bet my life on. Now we're not. We're, we're in the we're in the the hottest summer now, but. Every one of everybody's favorite holidays is is the candy holiday, especially when you're a kid. Halloween, right? Right. Now, what's the danger? What's the major danger that every parent and every grown up has about their ch- child going door to door, trick or treat, getting candy from stranger? What's the biggest danger, Joe? I remember this from my own childhood, and I am scared what you're about to tell me. But I remember coming home with a bag of candy. I would dump out my. Um, I didn't have a plastic pumpkin i had a a, um uh, a pillowcase because you could hold more in a pillowcase i'd dump it out <laughs> i was gonna just say you had a white trash but we couldn't afford that right? yep. our family we got the pillowcase <laughs> <That's why>. um, <laughs> which doubled as our costume we put it on our head for <laughs> as a ghost and then we take it off when we get to someone's house <laughs> you're, you're a ghost for the second house when you're wearing a a pillowcase on your head and when you got home you would dump it out and and my father would pick through the candy looking for needle marks and razor blades and adulterated candy because kids were getting poisoned and i found out that he was actually just taking chocolate from the bag because that was his favorite but ostensibly it's it's because kids get poisoned at halloween that's absolutely right and they actually have police stations where you're you can come in for free and they will scan your candy no (laughs) right i mean it's a big deal and you can't accept apples because the apples are good for you, but Razors. There's, you can put more stuff in them. Yeah. There haven't been any confirmed deaths from tainted Halloween cop. This started as a myth in 1907 because family members, family members poisoned their own kids with heroin on their candy. 
Oh. So then it got all this press, but the only poisoning that has gone on during Halloween has been parents doing it to their own children. Oh, that is so it's much not darker. not stranger danger. Yeah, and, and I've been saying this for years because the stranger danger thing, and I tell people, it isn't strangers that get your kids. It's it's the parents, it's uncles, aunts, school teachers, coaches, Boy Scout leaders, Girl Scout leaders, and usually a lot of times it's boyfriend and girlfriend violence. Right. And friends, friend we're social group, and this is just more evidence that. But Halloween, I thought that was a slam dunk. And that was my number one biggest myth that in this country we believe every year and probably will continue to. Oh, man. It's a, it was another moral panic just because it was an interesting story. I, it's funny. You talk about this. I just yesterday read about a mother who was um, secretly giving her kid gummy melatonin a- as candy because it would calm him down. And he ended up wolfing down an entire bag and ended up in the ER. But it's like, that's crazy. It's it's exactly the story. Okay, well that, I'm not going to be able to top that as far as like, myths that will change how you approach Halloween. Now it's game on for me. I'm too old to trick or treat, but by God I will just because I know I can eat everything that comes out of that house. <laughs> uh, Joe's going to have a kid just so he go trick or treating. No. He's worth it. That one day a year. <laughs> we're a kid, nuts to that. I'm. We're going to have a podcast event where you and I go trick or treating with a bunch of our listeners and we are all just going to show up <laughs> full grown adults in costume and trick or treat and we'll just eat whatever comes out. That'd be fun. Yeah, the, 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 everybody on the podcast I'm knows. Down. I'm down. Yeah. <laughs> you can't die from candy. <laughs> Uh, di- diabetes is not a myth, by the way. So we we are putting ourselves at risk just in that factor. Um, okay, so my my final myth. This one, some people might actually know, uh, but I chose it as my final myth because it tells me more about humans and how we should approach life than it does about the myth itself. So here's the myth: um, Have you heard that Einstein failed a class in school? Yeah, he failed. It was it was one of some of his specialties. Was it mathematics or something? That's exactly he the actually, myth. Yeah, yeah. That he that the. It's like wow. That's kind of that old. Well, if he failed, but he didn't give up. Right. You know. Right. Exactly. So so that's my point. So this myth, I, I've that's it. Yeah, I've heard that fail over and over. But look at Einstein. He didn't give up. Right. If if Einstein, who has redefined physics for us and how we see the world and how every like how light and time operate. If he failed math, then I can come back from a failure. Now, here's the truth of it. Einstein himself said, quote, I never failed in mathematics. Before I was 15, I had mastered differential and integral calculus. (laughs) But... Yeah, he's never failed a damn thing. (laughs) Right. Uh, He did fail his first entrance exam into the Swiss Federal Polytech School. Um, So... Because it's in a different language, probably, or something, <laughs> right? There must have been some reason. Right. Or, or I don't know. Or it's just test taking. Like, it doesn't necessarily have to be he failed the subject. It could just be, you know, he he failed a test. Or, I mean, like, I won't make excuses. I'm sure people uh, who know Einstein's history can come back and be like, here's the exact reason why. But no, he wasn't a failure at the subject. He He just, you know, he failed a test once, and then that story got so skewed. Because we like to believe that, you know, a genius of his caliber can fail at something so simple for, you know, like, like it makes us feel better. But here's the takeaway I have from it. He did fail something. Um, but I don't take that and, and look at it and say, oh, if Einstein failed math, I can fail something I love and, you know, I can, I can come back from it. This tells me the, we like to invent the myth of failures of genius, that a, a genius can fail this, so that means I can fail something and come back. What it tells me is, honestly, most of our real-life failures are failures of interest. It's, I wasn't interested enough in this subject, so I failed it. Or I wasn't interested enough in this, you know, I, I didn't pay attention enough, I, I didn't look deeply enough. I started a project, I mean, this literally happened to me, I started a project where I started patching something I was working on in, um, I'm building trailers for uh, a couple of months. I did something wrong and it wasn't because I lacked the expertise it's honestly just because I didn't read how to do it properly in the first place our failures Einstein if he had if he had studied for that Swiss Federal Polytech school exam I'm sure he would have done fine like it's 
I view that about school too. All the all the classes you failed in class, uh, I I failed geography in one year uh, in, in early high school. It was not because I was bad at geography. I love it. It just that year it was not of interest to me. Right, and that's something you could have studied and probably already knew. You just didn't care. Right, exactly. I I spent my time elsewhere. Like that was it. It was literally a question of time. I wasn't studying it. I wasn't even looking through the book. I was doing something else with that time, and it wasn't productive. I think it was like video games. But that's, I, I think that is a better lesson. That's honestly what we should be telling people is a failure of interest is a completely controllable factor. Einstein not knowing failure enough about interest. math, yeah, is is a failure of yeah. subject mastery. What really we should be teaching is a failure of interest is controllable as a factor, and that's what we should be teaching to our kids is here's how to hold your interest on a subject. Wasn't this funny? We both studied independently, and Joe comes up with things like the galaxy and and eighteen hundreds and all this history stuff, and I come up with penis size and Twinkies. <laughs> <laughs> this is a this is a good representation of where we're at, mature wise. And <laughs> I will say though, and that's why you're people are going to feel good hearing my takeaways of our myths, but they're going to remember yours. So. We got we got both of them. <laughs> well, this has been fun. This this has been like eating the Halloween candy afterward without feeling poison. So I I feel good about this. You're listening to the Ingen. Oh, wait, oops. That's it. Sorry, I was about to ask you to do the outro. So <laughs> I did just do the intro, so we gotta cut. Just continue. Out. Okay, I'm ready. Go for it. You've been listening to the Reengineered You. Thank you so much for listening to the show. You mean the world to us. We have a new episode every week. You can connect with us at www.re-engineeredu.com. That's where we have show notes, research links. And information you might not expect. Not necessarily all these myths, but you will find something from our archive. I guarantee it. We're not experts in anything, but we've got an opinion on everything.